Um, so this class is about the uh, new energy code and how that's going to impact and change the shape of architecture and how it will impact this architectural decisions. It's AIA continuing ed credit, which I'm sure you're aware of, and you need to get signed in if you aren't already signed in, and we will take care of that. We're going to look at how the, the standards impact architecture performance operation of the buildings, look at the performance-based path of compliance, look at the prescriptive-based path of compliance, and understand how to implement these things on our projects. Commercial Energy Code adoptions uh, as of August 2014. West Coast has already adopted uh, the modern codes. The majority of the country in blue is a little bit behind. I know in my home state of Florida, June 30th, 2015, we will be adopting uh, the new two-year late Florida Building Code, which is the ICC 2012, which is ASHRAE 90.1 2010. And so I tell people, you know, when you're developers that, that I work with and people, when you're upset about the new code, this is a six-year-old ASHRAE standard that we're talking about. <laughs> if you had a kid when this standard came out, they'd be in elementary school now, so don't get all bunched up about the new standard. Um, and then I was, I was doing this presentation in New Orleans, and one of the architects that I was working with down there said, you know, Normally, we include Mississippi on the list of anything we do because they're always last and it makes us feel better about ourselves. And in this case, Mississippi has already adopted ASHRAE 90.1-2010, and so there are other states that are actually further behind. So the next question I get usually from the development slash architectural group is, why do we keep changing the code? We just, it was great leave it alone, stop bothering me. And it's, it's because the world is constantly changing. And a good way to explain this is with something simple like roof insulation. On the blue straight line, diagonal line, if you put very little roof insulation on your building, it has a very low capital cost. And as you increase that insulation level, your capital cost goes up. The orange line would be your energy performance effect. So with no roof insulation, you have really high energy bills. As the insulation level goes up, it comes down, but it reaches a point where you have a law of diminishing returns. And so when you combine these two curves, you kind of get this purple curve. And some of the things they factor in include fuel prices and cost escalation and all these great things. And they come out with what they think somewhere in this range is a good recommendation for each of these things. And that is involved in the decision making on why they make the recommendations they make. I'm going to get back to this later on. I'm setting you up for this slide now. <laughs> so, do buildings use a lot of energy? With you guys, you obviously know this. But what I like to tell people, I like to usually ask them, so what uses the most energy inside the building? And people invariably say, oh, it's the air conditioning. And as a mechanical engineer, I don't like to hear that response. And I say, well, all right, time out. The reason you say that is because the envelope the fenestration, you don't plug those things in and you don't see how much electricity they're causing to be used. So as the mechanical engineer, there's nothing about my system putting heat into the space. It's the electrical engineers, it's the people in the space, and the architects. And if you designed a perfect envelope and an amazing lighting system, you wouldn't need my system to take your heat out of the building. <laughs> So rethink this, and instead of getting the, the symptom, let's go to the root cause and try to make you know, good decisions about energy uh, conservation. Next thing uh, to kind of put out there before we really dig into it is that, in my opinion, the United States Green Building Council was always trying to transform the market. They want to push the market to new heights. That was not the goal of the USGBC to be code. But lots of municipalities have adopted ordinances that say, hey, you need to be lead silver if you're going to build your building in this zone. I get it. That's really great. From a municipal planning standpoint, it allows you to make some decisions with your infrastructure uh, that allow you to increase development in your area. But 
they keep changing the lead system, obviously, to keep trying to stay in the front, forefront of this curve. And one of the ways I like to describe this is four or five years ago, you didn't see very many net zero national conferences. Now, there's three or four major national conferences just on net zero buildings. Six years ago when we did our first net zero building, people thought we had lost our mind. <laughs> we need to get you know, federal funding to do this. I'm like, you know, do it if you want to, but the building we were looking at was ground zero from where Hurricane Andrew had come into South Florida and that city council was fired up about making sure their building was off the grid, it could be running if another hurricane hit, whatever. Um, to the point that uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, I had a developer ask me about um, interviewing for a million and a half square foot urban building in Manhattan that would be off the grid. Just because he wants it to be off the grid. <laughs> I understand with DOD buildings around the world, they don't want to be tied to the local grid and they have uh, recommendations for those buildings to be net zero. But I'm starting to see this go from only the crazy people doing it to it's becoming more mainstream and not so, so far-fetched. How do you do that? It's a whole other story. But uh, anyway, the point is, USGBC wants to be pushing the curve, not in the middle of the bandwidth. So let's look now at ASHRAE 90.1. Over the years, you can see ASHRAE 90.1 has changed and become more and more energy efficient. And 2007 is what the, most of the blue states, and blue by the blue, the map we just showed a minute ago, are working from. In my opinion, it is extremely, or it is very easy to meet the code requirements with ASHRAE 90.1 2007. And a little, little secret behind the scenes, what happens in a mechan mechanical electrical engineering office when you're working on a project? You wait till the very last day and then somebody goes, hey, have you done the energy compliance thing? Oh, no, no, run over there. Somebody turn the computer. Let's run this thing real quick. Bang, bang, knock it out. And if it doesn't pass, you pick some benign thing like the water heater and you tweak it a little bit and it passes and it's not very hard to do because you pretty much know what needs to be in a building, standard building that's going to pass the energy code. When we make a 19% improvement in the requirements of the energy code, when we jump from 2007 to 2010, which is the ICC 2012 background, it is my strong recommendation <laughs> that before planning and zoning, you start running shoebox energy models of how your building is gonna perform. I live in an extremely litigious area in Miami, and if I waited until the last day and said, oh, <laughs> by the way, uh, your building doesn't pass the energy code, so we need to kind of go back through P and Z and it's gonna take a couple months off. Don't worry about your financing you have in place. It's no problem, we'll just redesign the whole building. Yeah, lawyer up, that's not gonna be a happy day. That is not gonna be a good time to bring that up. Just putting that out there that in my opinion, the energy community needs to be very proactive. As this code tightens up, we can't rely on the understanding of the owners and developers and architects to go, oh, but it's gonna be a lot harder to pass the energy code Let's make these changes. I think we need to be very proactive and try to be partners. A lot of times engineers are not even invited to the dance until after the facade is already set. Well, after the facade is already set through planning and zoning, what am I realistically gonna do for you? Change the light levels? I mean, yes, that's a great thing, but it really tied our hands at that point. It needs to be early on. Um, so 19% is, is nothing to, to laugh at here, and as we dig through this, most of the tools and tricks that I have as a mechanical engineer for manipulating this thing to get it to pass the energy code are now part of the baseline. There are not a whole lot of little extra tricks in my bag that I'm gonna be able to pull out if you egregiously violate some of the standards <laughs> to, to get it back in there. We'll, we'll kind of go over that. So when you approach the code compliance Today we're going to talk about uh, the prescriptive performance and the mandatory requirements. Something uh, I find fascinating because I'm a nerd and I look at this and I'm watching the weatherman out here in Las Vegas, <laughs> totally fascinated at the climate out here because they feel like 20% relative humidity is absolutely oppressive. Um, 
But if you look at ASHRAE Zone 1, where I'm from in Miami, if we can play Where's Waldo and find any other place in North America, or even Central America for that matter, that is ASHRAE Zone 1, and you will not find it. Tropical engineering, which is what I do, is entirely different. I can't count how many times somebody says, well, I've done projects in San Diego, same thing. I'm like, yeah, well, not really. Not according to people that know. Not Brownsville, Texas, not New Orleans, not anywhere. <laughs> By the same token, I'm really stunned that the northern half of Minnesota and Maine are in ASHRAE Zone 7, which to me, you know, it pretty to me anything north of 2 is like the North Pole. But some of these changes don't even apply to ASHRAE Zone 7 because they think it's, you know, such a different climate than what we see in, in the middle bandwidth here. Um, so you got to know where you are with your project. I work with an architectural professor at UM, and he's talking to his students, and he says, I want to be able to look at your design project, and I can tell from how you designed it, where on the planet it is, and what orientation it is. I thought, hmm, that's pretty good. So how do you comply with the energy code? Well, uh, lead version 4 is going to request that you use 90.1-2010, which is a little bit more stringent than ICC 2012. And ICC 2012, a lot of times when it's adopted by states, the states, the states make a few little changes too. So again, you've got to know where you're working. But once we're into compliance, you pick either the prescriptive path or the performance path. In 25 years of doing work in Miami, I have never seen a prescriptive path project because no one wants to spend that amount of money on the glass. We buy horrible glass down there because there's no temperature difference between inside and outside. I'm sure every, every temperature zone has its little weird quirks like that as well. But some of the changes that are going to impact the architectural decisions are going to start driving people to the performance path, to the prescriptive path. Performance path is do whatever you want or run an energy model and if it passes, it passes. Prescriptive path is you have to follow every single requirement to the letter. If you change one thing, you're now on the performance path with the need to run an energy model to show compliance. So the architects call me and say, hey, what, what uh, wall insulation level do I need? I say, well, are you doing prescriptive or performance? And they look a little perplexed. And then I say, R13. <laughs> because you know, if you're looking at your baseline and you're going to, and even if they want to go the energy route, energy modeling route, I've got to beat that. So it just saves a whole lot of dialogue. Um, keep in mind, not only did some of the requirements tighten up on this prescriptive path, down here in the blue box, they added an optional, not an optional, added an additional requirement that says, hey, once you're done with all this stuff, then you got to pick one of these three things. Could be better lighting, could be better air conditioning, could be uh, renewable energy on your building. So start thinking, when I said all of my little tricks that I keep in my goodie bag to help us beat the energy model baseline, this baseline building may have renewable energy on it. Now, if you take the energy modeling route, something to point out at the bottom here, it needs to be 15% better than the standard reference building. Standard reference building is not quite the prescriptive path. It has a few variations. But keep in mind, uh, less than 85 means 15% you know, better. So it is a complicated thing to do to pass that. So if your customer says, I don't want to take the risk of, of diving into this thing and going the energy model route, and we get down to the end of this thing and something changes and the contractor gets a better deal on some lousy glass or something, something sneaks into the, now all of a sudden we don't meet the prescriptive, I don't want the risk. Going into this thing, I'm borrowing money from the bank, make sure you follow the prescriptive route. If you follow the prescriptive route, you are limited to 30% glass. Usually when I say that in an AIA meeting, it's like a napalm bomb going off, watching the, <laughs> the reaction go across the room. If you add daylighting controls, you can take that up to 40%. But mentally, I try to drive home 30%. Uh, they have simplified some of the tables and changed a few of the things. To give, 
an idea of what this is like. Uh, this is a four-story office building, 100,000 square feet. And what we did is the little blue bar on the far left is your prescriptive route building, 30% glass, glass that meets the prescriptive code, so on and so forth. And then the next question from the developer owner is going to be, hey, what if we bump this up to 40? What if we bump it up to 66% glass? What is going to happen to this? Well, you can see it goes up quickly up to 110%. You're no longer in the prescriptive route because prescriptive, you have to follow every single rule to the T. As soon as you go into the performance route, you got to beat it by 15%. You're now 10% in the hole. You've got to beat it by 15%. Not a good situation to be in. If you use the same lousy glass we normally see on buildings, and I tell them, you know, when you talk to me about what you call expensive glass, we call that code minimum glass, okay? <laughs> There's no way. If you're 40% traditional developer glass and you're 26% over, that you're going to get 15. That's, that's not ever going to happen. You're never going to meet the energy code that way. So again, starting to communicate this up front is really important because architects pick out the glass, mechanical engineers pick out the air conditioning, and very rarely do we actually pick up the phone and call each other and coordinate and say, let me give you some input on the shading coefficient solar heat gain factor on your glazing. Should happen, just telling you. In reality, sometimes getting engineers and architects to talk is like pulling teeth. Now that first graph I showed you where I was trying to highlight that if you bought more insulation, your energy costs would drop down a law of diminishing return. Same thing is happening here. Let's say you said, all right, well, instead of the, the standard reference building, what if I dropped it down to 20% window to wall ratio? That's where the law of diminishing return starts to come in. You can drop to 20% window to wall, you can put better glass, you can put insulated, you can go through all these steps and you know, you're gonna pick up like five or 6%, uh, that's great, but it's not going to make as big of a ne as the negative impact if you go the other way. So um, it's, it's fine if you want to do that. We, one of our guys attended a Greenbuild Brazil class on daylight harvesting, and the architect showed how you can effectively daylight harvest tire building 30% glass or 40%, somewhere in that range. So it doesn't have to be 100% glass to effectively daylight harvest the building. Common misperception. We'll, look at that a little bit later as well. Um, so your capital cost, another thing is when pe people look at this stuff, they frequently look at it in silos. Hey, I can get a great deal on this glass. But nobody asks the engineer, how much bigger is your air conditioning system going to be? Because a lot of times on spec office buildings, we went 350 square feet per ton. <laughs> and if you don't take that credit on the engineering system for the savings you're getting in the glass, you're, you're going down the wrong path here. So when you integrate these things together, you can see the little blue line as the, as the actual tonnage is going up. And I usually estimate $2,000 a ton, but one of the CMs I work with said it's closer to 9,000. I was like, wow, uh, didn't see that coming. Point being, don't start off in a hole. Don't start off where you gotta dig yourself out of this, out of this hole. So let's dig into some of these prescriptive requirements. Solar heat gain coefficient is all about the radiation heat coming through the glass. In my climate, the convective conductive heat transfer is never more than 20 degrees difference between inside and outside, not on the coldest day of the winter or the hottest day in the summer. So to us, the U value completely does not matter. What we're interested in is the solar heat gain coefficient, which is a factor of 10 times larger than that contribution from the U value. The U value is resisting the, the temperature heat from inside and outside. You can see there's zero degrees outside, 70 inside. So imagine you're in Boston, which is higher than climate zones one, two, and three. And so a U-value there, insulated glass, that is a great investment. That is a wonderful thing. In climate zones one, two, and three, kind of like the Sun Belt, not such a big deal. What you're worried about here is a solar heat gain coefficient, which is a ratio of the amount of heat reflected out versus the amount of heat let it in. So the worst possible glass would have a solar heat gain coefficient of 1.0. Completely opaque black panel would be zero. Uh, you'll see later on that uh, for those climate zones in, in the Sun Belt, they're recommending, I think it's usually 0.25. 
Most of the glass I see going in buildings is somewhere around 0.6. Um, you tell somebody they've got to buy glass that has a 0.25 shading coefficient, and you don't need the insulation value in the sun belt, but in order to get that solar heat gain coefficient, you end up with insulated glass. And so the, the, <laughs> the misconception is, oh, we have to have insulated glass. I'm like, you do, but not because of the insulation property. You do because you need the solar heat gain coefficient. And another one of my favorites is low E. So I'm putting new windows on my house, and I told the guy I want a low solar heat gain coefficient. I want it to be about 0.25. Don't worry, we got low E glass. I'm like, That's nice. I didn't say anything about low E, but thanks for bringing that up. What I want is a low shading. No, 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 we got low E glass. I'm like, again, thanks, thanks for the <laughs> useless information, but that's not what we need. Uh, a very simplified way to explain what low E glass is, is little uh, metal particles and things in, in the glass, and it will actually reflect the heat. It's not gonna absorb it. And so the heat from inside will actually get reflected back inside. And I explain it this way. If you live in North Carolina and it's hot during the day, energy is gonna go basically into that glass. And it's not exactly the way it works, but this, it helps architects understand this. And then at night, when the temperature drops to 35, 40 degrees, if you've ever walked by a window in a cold climate and you just felt the heat getting sucked out of your body when you walk by that glass, if you have low E glass, it's gonna keep radiating warmth back out. So it's gonna make that tenant experience much more pleasant if you live in Washington, D.C. or St. Louis or any of these kind of places, if you have that low E glass. It's gonna reflect all the heat from inside, keep it inside, and, and you're not gonna have that miserable cold sucking experience when you walk by the window. If you live in Miami, and it's 90 degrees outside at midnight, you don't really care if the window's radiating heat back out. <laughs> it goes into the I don't care category. There's only two things I care about when I'm working with an architect on the glass. One is the solar heat gain coefficient, and the other one is the visible light transmittance. Why the visible light transmittance? Because that impacts my ability to do daylight harvesting. I don't care about the U value, but if you get above climate zone two, U value is very important, um, and low E as you get to the middle. Once you, once you are kind of beyond, I'm not sure, once you're up to that uh, climate zone seven, I'm not sure the low E part really matters again, but don't hold me to that. So we're gonna see a little bit later on that there's a recommendation that the light to solar gain ratio be around 1.5. We, from our experience, 1.5 to two is, is fine. And that is if you take your visible light transmittance and you divide it by your solar heat gain, so if you had a visible light of 60 and solar heat gain of 40.4, you divide those two, you get 1.5. Um, so there's, there are recommendations about the light to solar gain ratio. We found that if you make that visible transmittance too high, you'll end up with a glare problem in the building. And let me tell you, glare is far worse than the good you will ever do from daylight harvesting. In my opinion, daylight harvesting is, if not the biggest, second biggest energy conservation measure you can do in a building if it's integrated into the design. Totally blow that out if you do a design that has a glare problem. For example, uh, longitudinal studies in California say that students perform 20% better in naturally lit spaces. They perform 40% worse if there's a glare problem. So um, just having windows and letting daylight in not a good strategy, <laughs> needs to be effectively designed. So let's look at the prescriptive approach. I've got a box around climate zone one, but all the other climate zones are here. I blow up there because I don't have my glasses on. Roof R20 in a zone one, zone two climate in a commercial office building. Again, I'm, I know nothing about single family home residential projects, so this is all uh, commercial buildings. First of all, the roof only impacts the top floor. And second of all, if you, in my opinion, if you go above R20 in the southern climates, you're never going to see a payback. Um, obviously, as you get further north, you're a winter heating driven climate. I'm not sure what winter and heating are, but I've heard they're really scary things. Um, R20 for zone one, and then the, the recommendation changes as you go out. That is actually, at least for our zone, was not a change. Uh, and different types of walls have different R values. We find that even though the R value for a mass wall is like R6, if you make a tilt wall building and you put office tenants close to that wall, 
they will not be happy because they will sense heat coming through that mass wall. We frame out and put a little bit of insulation in there or you will not have class A office space. Um, just a little tidbit on the side there. There was a big change in the U value in zone one. They dropped from 1.2. So uh, up in the top right corner, we have a little discussion about the difference between U value and R factor. So the Pink Panther talks about R20 and the pink stuff and rolls it out and take that sum number of all the different R values of your assembly, flip it over and that's your U value. So if you had an R10, you would have a U value of 0.1. R20 would be 0 0.05. I don't know how on earth you could have an assembly with an R so bad, you would end up with a U value of 1.2. I mean, a piece of cellophane has more, because the inside and outside air films, <laughs> I don't know where that came from originally. Um, but now it's down to 0 0.5 and 0.65, and zone two uh, dropped a little bit, and I think as you see on out, a um, little bit of change there, it's not, not huge. And we're talking about, when we talk about the 30% uh, window to wall ratio, it's the condition space wall at the, at the line of insulation, not the parapet wall and everything above it. Does not include door areas and some other things. Um, just a little architectural math problem. Here you see a typical building with a 30% uh, wall area, window to wall ratio. Um, in climate zones one through six, up to 40% with daylighting controls. So we're going to dig into what daylighting controls are, because that is your first question. Daylighting controls, 50% in a daylight zone. Okay, well now what's a daylight zone? Well, the way they describe a daylight zone is if you have a, a uh, roof above your floor and you have a two by two skylight, that daylight zone extends about 12 feet in each direction. If you have a, a window on, on the vertical surface there, you know, say six feet wide, you're gonna get about 15 foot penetration, 10 feet wide. When you're looking at daylight penetration into the space, it's all about the height of the window. It does not matter where the bottom of the window is, doesn't make any difference at all. It's about how high the window is, it defines how deep the light is gonna penetrate into the space. A little bit later on, we're gonna talk a little bit more about daylight harvesting strategies and types of glass um, and aesthetics. So in that daylight zone, you need daylight controls of your lighting controls. I used to brush over this point until somebody really pounded into my head how important this is. Now I get it. <laughs> and so I'm gonna make a point to you. Plan view is down here. And plan view is there too. So this is a window sticking out. It does. It's. Right. Got it. I understand. <laughs> I'll have to look in the book. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I want to say this is class A office space with nine foot ceilings. So you're looking at an eight foot high top of your window for this particular number. Um, but I'll put an asterisk on that answer. I don't have the entire thing memorized, uh, but we'll need to. Logically, it should. Logic, logically it should, but you would think, you know, the book could get infinitely long if, if you had every possible arrangement of glass. So they may have just put a, here's an example kind of thing. But good question, I, and I should have that memorized and I don't. <laughs> Sorry about that. NFRC labeling of the glass. So, uh, you specify the glass, has all the right properties you want. Contractor comes along, hey, I can get a great deal on this glass made by my brother's uncle's nephew's best friend in Tulsa. Boom, shows up, does not have the NFRC rate sticker on the glass. You say, hey, I need this. I need it, and I need it, I need it. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. And we'll next meeting, we'll get it. Never happens. If you don't get that label on the glass, you have to use the default values. The default values uh, here for the U value, any one of these, you can see 1.2, 0.8, 2.0, none of these meet those prescriptive values you just saw in the table. If you don't get the sticker, you're now in the performance route. You gotta get this labeling, and it has to obviously meet the criteria 
or you are now kicked out of the prescriptive route and you're in the performance path. Shading coefficient, solar heat gain coefficient, sorry, I'm old, I keep calling it shading coefficient. It used to be 0.25 in zone one, it still is 0.25, but no one ever followed the prescriptive route, so nobody knew that. If you don't get the sticker, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, you're now in the, in the performance route. So that is how important this NFRC labeling testing of the glass is. You've got to drive that home on the contractor. You have to have that on the glass. If you're already following the energy model route, then obviously you don't care, but I think it's a good thing. Do you get any kind of credit from uh, having overhangs and fins and all this kind of stuff? Yes, there is an allowance in there, and there's actually a mistake in the code. Um, so if your projection factor, uh, which is designed by the extension over the height, uh, is between 0.2 and 0.5, it'll give you a little bit of an allowance. And if your projection factor, it says less than, but it means it actually should be greater than uh, 0 0.5. If you were to use that multiplier, 1.6, on climate zones one through three, your 0.25 solar heat gain coefficient would go from 0.25 to 0.4, which is a much more commonly available product. From running enough energy models in the last 25 years, I will tell you, in my opinion, overhangs and fins are totally worthless when it comes to energy conservation inside your building. High performance glass wins hands down all day, every day. If you imagine this wall on this little cartoon here is the west wall, after three o'clock, the sun is coming right in. And you're, if this happens to be a K through 12 school and everybody leaves at 1.30 and that's the west side, great. If that's the east side, not so good. Um, yes, 100 years ago, fins and overhangs were great things. We have technology now. If you like it because of the aesthetic, nobody ever asks engineers how to dress, okay? So if you like your building with these things on there, go for it. Uh, if you want it to be the answer to all of your performance issues, not going to happen. High performance glass will, will beat it hands down. Back to the daylight harvesting uh, concept. Obviously, uh, most of my customers are concerned about their budgets, and they start freaking out at the cost of what I consider expensive glass, the vision glazing, where you have your shading coefficient at 0 0.25 and it's going to be insulated glass because to get that solar heat gain coefficient, it has to be to have the glazing on the number two surface and, and argon filled and all this kind of stuff. Um, so if I want to daylight harvest the building, I try to convince them to buy cheap glass for the daylight harvesting panes. What does this do the aesthetics? I don't know. Again, no, nobody asks me about aesthetics. But the input I can give them is, hey, their daylight harvesting pane, the energy code recognizes you're trying to let light in because you're trying to improve the energy performance in the building. So it's going to let you have a higher solar heat gain coefficient. And ideally, uh, you use some sort of product, whether it's a nanogel or a light louver or a, just a translucent pane, something that is going to take that light and bend it back up to the ceiling so that you're getting an indirect lighting effect. Your vision glazing, and, and not getting a glare problem with the light coming through there, your vision glazing should be you know, knocking that visible light transmittance down because you're not daylight harvesting with that pane, you're daylight harvesting with a top pane. So your VLT can drop down to something much lower so you absolutely do not have a glare problem, but you keep your shading coefficient low because that's a much larger pane of glass and you keep that radiation heat out. So divide and conquer, do your high visible light transmittance up top to let your daylight in for the daylight harvesting, low visible light transmittance below there's a tiny amount of daylight harvesting glass, so if your solar heat gain coefficient goes up a little bit, no big deal, uh, but you want to keep it down on the, on the lower one. Is there any, uh, any strategy for modeling on the shelf? Does it not need quite the resolution that the software Yes, there absolutely is, and the, the software calculations for daylight harvesting have gone through a massive overhaul in the last 12 months. We used to do the little lead thing where you look at uh, 25 foot candles, 30 inches above the floor on the equinox and blah, 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 blah. And now uh, there's a initial runs for spatial, we call it spatial daylight autonomy. So you make a first pass, you, you draw the building in 3D space and you simulate the sun moving around, you turn all the lights off 
And you see, if you have enough light to do daylight harvesting, that's your spatial daylight autonomy, then you run it again on a thing called annual sun exposure, and that tells you where you have glare problems, and you, and you start to tweak these uh, solar heat gain coefficients, and that's your energy consumption, and your visible light transmittance to get daylight savings without getting glare, and then you run your average annual lux. And I made the mistake about a year ago of telling an architect, hey, we can run these things for you, and here's my fee to do this. And then I got into it and realized, wait a second, this is more like a dance. This is not a you tell me to do this and I give you the answer. When I do a load calculation, I take the building envelope, run the load, and here's the size of your air conditioner. When I do an energy model, I take the 3D model, I run get schedules and times for the pencil sharpeners and all the stuff, and boom, here's your energy consumption. With this, I'm changing the amount of glass, the look of the glass, and it's like, well, okay, well, do you like this? <laughs> what, what aesthetic light look are you trying to get in this space? And it's not something that he can just say, here's the background, give me the answer. It's a very interactive process now to determine that. In my, in my opinion, light shelves are nothing but aesthetics. They make a bright spot in one or two places inside the building. There are much better new strategies for bending and broadcasting that light onto the ceiling, uh, like the nanogels I talked about, the, the uh, light louvers. There's a bunch of other strategies. And what you're trying to do is diffuse that light onto the ceiling rather than bouncing it like a pool cue ball onto one hot spot there. <laughs> the, 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 uh, daylight harvesting, when you have a single story building, real easy, you just poke holes in the roof and, and spread the light out. Trying to get on a multi-story building where you're trying to pull the lights in from the, light in from the edges and get an even light level so you don't have a hot spot at the window and, and less light here, takes a substantially more uh, design skill and meticulous attention to detail. But in the last year, like I was telling you, all these programs that run the spatial daylight autonomy and annual sun, all these things, Nobody did this that I know of a year ago, but at Green Build in New Orleans, everybody's showing. I went to one of these classes, and some of the people are up there talking, saying, well, first we ran it in Rhino, and then we ran it in Grasshopper. And I'm looking at my friends going, are we still talking about daylight in here? <laughs> I don't know what a Rhino or a Grasshopper is, but, <laughs> but these are third-party apps that work with architectural sketch-up that they can simulate all kinds of amazing things. The power of, of what they can do on their iPads now is amazing. Um, and so, you know, the dirty little secret used to be that we would take the 3D building and would give it to the lighting vendor and say, here, turn all your product off and tell me how many foot candles I have in the building because I'm not getting paid to do this. And he would say, why would I do this? And I would say, well, do you want your product spec? <laughs> yes, okay, well, help us out here and we'll all work together on this thing. Um, but it's becoming more and more of an important factor from the energy standpoint, but people are starting to realize the productivity and health benefits. When somebody walks into a green building and it is effectively daylit, they look around and they go, wow, I like this building. Nobody walks in a building and goes, mm, smells like MERV 16 filtration. You know? <laughs> it doesn't happen. <laughs> but everybody notices every one of these home and garden TV shows. I want to knock out all the walls and I want all this natural light in there. I mean, that is. Who designed all these buildings with all these little rat-worn walls all over the place? Uh, anyway, um, yeah, that world of designing for daylight harvesting changing incredibly over the last 12 months. And so have the products that perform this daylight function on, uh, on trying to bend it. When we talk about the energy code driving the shape of architecture, what I'm not saying here is that you will, if the architect is on top of their game, you will start to see thinner buildings instead of the big square building, because they're trying to get that light from the edges and push it in, so the buildings are starting to be more narrow with courtyards in the middle and, and ways to, to pipe this light in and out. Um, there are products that actually catch the sunlight on the roof, run it through a fiber optic cable, and then broadcast it out through what looks like a two by two fixture. And I'm, I'm, I guess I'm okay with that. I like the idea of it being natural light and everything, but it doesn't quite give you the same connection to outside and ambiance and everything. But if you have a janitor's closet in the bowels of your building, eh, it's better than, better than nothing. They're very expensive. 
The code now does account for dynamic glazing. Dynamic glazing would be the glass that you put a little electrical charge on it and it goes from completely opaque to almost completely transparent. So you can get really great uh, solar heat gain coefficient values and visible light transmittance. Have a building in Washington, D.C. faces east, right towards uh, all the, the monuments. And that we're totally gutting and reskinning this thing. And I said, man, if I was you, I would, on the east side of this building, I would put this dynamic glazing. And when the sun comes up, have it be really dark so everybody can do their work without glare. And then after 1130, when the sun's over the top, open this thing up. Everybody's got this beautiful view of, of all the monuments. National Mall. And uh, think of the marketing buzz you'll get. Everybody drove by that building in the morning. They're like, I drove by that building. It was black this morning. And now it's it's clear, you know, <laughs> peak some interest and uh, on east-west exposures, there's nothing that will beat this strategy. Um, yeah, high performance class is great, but every second of all these projects, they're a thousand feet long with all the windows facing east and west. I'm like, oh, face palm, how does this happen? But because you buy a piece of land, the land is the shape that the land is, and that's what you got to deal with. Um, if you're able to do this, you will save a tremendous amount of energy and when you clear that glass up, you'll get a lot of productivity boost. And you can walk around with your iPhone and change the piece of glass next to your desk. So if you have somebody, a you know, bu bunch of Revit jockeys that like it to be pitch black at their desk so they can work on their computer, they can keep their glass dark. And you got the marketing people and they want theirs all clear <laughs> and opened up. So the code allows for this. Um, and you use the, the maximum visible light transmittance and the maximum solar heat gain coefficient when you're figuring out that light to solar gain ratio, that's that second bullet. Um, but when you're figuring out your solar heat gain number, solar heat gain coefficient, you're using the actual lowest number, which is gonna be like 0 0.02 or something off the charts low. Now, uh, skylights are gonna be required. This is a uh, minimum skylight fenestration area. So if you have a, a I was gonna say one story, but it's, it's the, if you have a space that's underneath the roof, large open space, think ports, airports, courthouses, libraries, any of these spaces, greater than 10,000 square feet directly under a roof, ceiling heights over 15 feet, you're going to be required to have skylights. And the skylights are going to be more than, you're going to have to daylight more than 50% of the space. There are exceptions, and here we go back to the, the North Pole areas of the country, the climate zone six through eight or you're not going to have to do that. You're not going to be required to do that. So it helps to know where you are. Obviously, if you have a light power density that's really low, if you have a movie theater, you're not going to have skylights on the top of a movie theater. A little common sense here. Um, so this is kind of a shock to the architectural community. Usually architects like this idea, but their owners are not going to be aware this is now a requirement. So. 10, 20 years ago when we would do our design work as a mechanical engineer, I would ask the electrical guy, what's your light power density? He says, I don't know, won't know till the last day we turn the job in. I'm like, that's not gonna help me with my energy model. So I'm gonna make a guess. 20 years ago, I would guess two watts a square foot. Then the electrical engineers got really talented or something changed and we would start to guess one watt a square foot. I'm on the phone with a customer in Manhattan who's doing a project down in my area and I'm trying to impress him how awesome I am. And I said, you know, we always design for 0.8 watts per square foot because that's the, the break line where you're going to get lead credits and everything. And she said, well, that, that's actually code in Manhattan. It's like, oh, so you're not impressed. <laughs> okay, never mind. Scratch that whole little sales pitch. So offices are 1.0 and the new code, 0.9. So when you're trying to show how awesome your building is and get all your lead points and do all these things and you're dropping it down to 0.8, baseline's 0.9, that's not gonna, it's, I mean, it's good by all means, but if you start it off with a bad envelope, that is not gonna dig you out of the hole, going to 0.8 watts a square foot when the baseline is gonna be 0.9. Uh, other spaces as well have changed. In my opinion, LEDs are not the answer for everything. I love LEDs. I think they're fantastic. I will use them all over my house. Um, we go into a lot of buildings, believe it or not, still have T12s. And people get cranked up about having to take their incandescents out. And one, one of my customers was really fired up about the incandescents. And I said, you know, let's get in our horse and buggy, hop out on I-95, drive up to DC, and tell the politicians what we think about that. <laughs> He's like, you're a jerk. I was like, yeah. 
Yes, I know, change happens. Um, I see commonly people go into T12 installations and they put the 25 watt T8s and you get a one and a half, two year payback, amazing. Um, we've done project designs with T5s where we did a core and shell with a T5 and then somebody came in and put thousands of little eight foot by eight foot offices in there. And now I have to have a T5 in every single one of these freaking offices and my capital cost goes up through the roof because ideally your T5 is designed to use a small light source, a smaller bulb that you spread it out over a bigger space. So it's a little counterintuitive to now have lots of little bitty honeycombs with these T5 lights in there. It's, it's gonna hurt you on your capital cost. And as you move to the right, the more efficient light fixtures, what I tell people is, is your light emitting source gets smaller and smaller until you get to the point where it's an LED. And now your challenge is finding a way to evenly spread that light back out thing I love about LEDs is in a really tall space, if you want to shine that thing and create a spot on the wall, an LED is really good for that. If you have a really high atrium and you don't want to create this ball of light that lights the whole thing, you want to bang, put it on the floor, LED is awesome for that. Uh, and a lot of things. Um, the point here is that you want a lighting design, not just a one solution fits all sort of approach. When we talked about the prescriptive path, we said after you meet all of those prescriptive requirements that change that we talked about, now you gotta pick one of these three. More efficient lighting. Wow, the baseline was already at 0.9. Gotta be more efficient than that. Air conditioning systems more efficient or uh, renewable energy systems, 3% um, of the regulated energy. And I can imagine most customers just going through the roof when they hear that. But, if you're following the prescriptive route, you gotta pick one of those. If you're following the energy modeling slash performance route, again, if you step one piece of criteria off the prescriptive path, you are now in the performance path, no question. And when you do that, you run an energy model of the whole building and you're ideally having trade-offs, good things and bad things, you mush them all together in this little mulligan stew and out pops the answer and it meets the, the code. And it's got to be 15% less than the standard reference building design. Standard reference building design is not the prescriptive route. It's similar, but not exactly the same. For example, uh, your standard reference, if your building is 40% glass, your standard reference building is also gonna be 40% glass. The prescriptive path was capped at 30%. So there's some changes in, in how this energy model is run. One of the big changes, you wanna talk to your code official and say, don't make me use the same crummy old programs we used from 20 years ago. Some of them are better now, some are improved, but there's a lot of programs out there. We use one called IESVE Pro, we use eQuest, we use, don't limit me. <laughs> some programs are better at some things and some programs are better at other things. Don't limit me to just one program. I wanna use the one that's the best application for this project. Clear that with the code official from the beginning is my recommendation. And help them understand the output so that you know, I would hate when somebody threw something in front of me, a phone book full of numbers and said, hey, here's some output from some software you've never seen, check it off and sign off, and I wouldn't want to do that either. But you, know, you work through it, and we found so far, you know, work together and, and it'll work out. There are mandatory things that are neither, got it, thank you, both, you have your prescriptive stuff we talked about in your performance route. Mandatory, it doesn't care which of those two routes you took, you have to do these. And one of the interesting things is continuous air barrier, uh, establishing a continuous air barrier in the building. So you have your walls, your doors, your windows, uh, everywhere you have a, a light spun into the soffit outside. And on climate zones one through three, the sun belt pretty much, you don't have to do this air barrier testing on the opaque surfaces, the wall and the roof, but you do have to do it on the windows and, and the lighting and every other door and little gizmo put on the building. So when you look at this air barrier testing, there's three ways to meet it. One is you have materials that meet the air barrier testing. The second one is if you build some assembly in the shop, you can test that. And the third way is whole building leakage testing. My, I anticipate that the, the idea that you're gonna go through every single one of these materials and get your air testing is it's not gonna happen. Or that what, what you're gonna see is a lot more people just doing whole building air barrier testing. Nobody's gonna to wanna to keep track of all this. I mean, maybe they will, but I don't think so. That's my opinion, not a fact. And so, even in the zones one through three, 
you've still got to do air, air leakage testing on all these things, uh, doors and, and storefront and, and skylights. And Wouldn't you rather just build a building and then put the fan in there, do your blower testing, sign off, you're done? <laughs> um, so we anticipate there will be a lot more air leakage testing involved in the final uh, construction administration of the project and therefore a lot more people paying closer attention during construction to make sure the air tightness is met with each of these components. Mandatory requirements, commissioning, demand control ventilation. These are not, oh, I went the prescriptive route. I have to do demand control. This is mandatory. So when I talked in the beginning about I have a little bag of tricks that helps you get over the energy conservation line, one of my big tricks was always demand control ventilation. That's in the baseline. Daylight control. So when you let daylight into a building, that doesn't save you energy. It only saves you energy when you dim the lights. We already went over that. That's required. <laughs> More efficient air conditioning is required. In certain climate zones, uh, the, the heat recovery equipment is required. What am I going to find in my bag of tricks that's going to help you if that this is all in the baseline system. So where we used to always do the performance route because it was extremely easy to tweak some little benign thing, you're going to see a lot of people saying, I, I got a lot of $200 million wrapped up in this thing. I don't want the risk of getting to the very end and, oh, I made a mistake. Yeah, we don't pass now. <laughs> so you may see more pressure on the prescriptive route from the very beginning. If you're not, Again, I strongly recommend shoebox level energy modeling before planning and zoning so that we don't get to the end of this job and the poor little mechanical engineer pipes up and says, oh, by the way, we don't meet the energy code. <laughs> All these things are mandatory. Mandatory commissioning of lighting. Uh, and then we talked about um, Side lit areas greater than 250 square feet, top lit greater than 900 square feet. All these places are now going to be uh, daylight controls, daylight zones. So keep in mind, uh, a lot of people have traditionally done this performance route with trade offs. I think you're going to see a lot more people going the prescriptive route. It's going to be shocking to a lot of people who have used to 100% glass buildings uh, to now take that into consideration. And that's it. Thank you for your time. We have uh, some time for question and answer. And I think the uh, gentleman with the camera may or may not want to hone in on you or something. Um, yes, sir. So when you say solar, I take that to mean one of three things, converting sunlight into hot water, converting sunlight into electricity, and turning sunlight into lighting energy in the space so you can turn your artificial lighting off. I, again, I'm not the one funding the building, so I'm extremely happy with all the daylighting requirements. <laughs> I think daylighting is the greatest thing ever. Uh, using sunlight for hot water is a multi-thousand-year-old technology. I don't know why it isn't on every building. Um, as far as taking sunlight and making electricity out of it, I'm a huge fan. It doesn't work so well at night. Um, I think that's really an economic thing. I, I don't know that you want to, I don't like telling people what they have to do. Even though we, we do commissioning, I don't like the idea that commissioning is mandatory in the code because I think anytime you cram it down somebody's throat, every little bump in the road from that on after is now my fault. You know, <laughs> I think it is the best thing to do and I think it adds value to the building. I'm a little leery that, of mandating it through codes. But I think as, as uh, the prescriptive route, you know, I see the, the options of the better lighting, you know, how much better, you know, the law of diminishing return, how much better are you really gonna make this lighting? And then the air conditioning system, if you, if you reduce the size of the overall energy consumption through good envelope, good lighting, your air conditioning is already as small as possible. The cost of additional efficient air conditioning is not a big deal. So I'd rather people look at the route of renewable energy. I think that there's a bunch of ways to approach that to knock the cost down. 
and then some of that will be involved if, if this uh, Tesla battery thing ever comes around. That would be really cool to see the cost of that drop, especially when we go back to the concept of net zero buildings. Any DOD building overseas, if my understanding, has to be net zero. Um, we have a lot of people in remote areas. We're running the copper out there. It's too expensive. Cost of batteries and everything, if they come down, you'll see a lot more photovoltaics. I am a huge fan of photovoltaics. And you know, I have uh, customers that we start our little lead charrette, and they're like, nah, I don't want to look at PVs. They're too expensive. It's like, wait a second. You get an investment tax credit. You're a long-term hold. You're a university or something. You're, are you going to sell this building? I don't think so. So pays back in seven to 15 years, something like that. <laughs> Why would you not do this? <laughs> Understand if you're a build, a build and flip developer, you know, there's nothing there for you. But if you're a long-term hold, you should already be looking at, at photovoltaics, whether the code says it or not. Now, if you design an inefficient building and you're going to have a massive PV system, well, that's just crazy to start off with. I mean, you got to spend the money on the envelope first, then the lighting, then the air conditioning, and then the PV, in my opinion. Does that even come close to answering your question? <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Right. Continue, yeah. And, and you. Right. Yes. Yeah, you are you are spot on. Exactly correct with that. I don't think about that because again, I'm from Climate Zone One. And we don't even need insulation. <laughs> but. But yeah, I mean, how many times have you looked in there in the ceiling and in between the studs, you can see every one of the studs and there's the insulation and every one of those is a thermal break, you know, where the temperature and the energy is being transferred through that stud. You are spot on. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I, that was an oversight. Yes, good point. I don't think I could have said it any better than you just said it. So any other questions? Are we? Yes, sir. It's, in Florida, it's up to the discretion of the, of the authority having jurisdiction. So the, the, we have the Florida Compliance with the Energy Code, FLA.com, which is fine if the whole building's done and you just run it. But if you're in the pre-schematic zone where you're doing massing and orientation, it is not useful at all. So you would rather have something like VE Pro where you can mush and squeeze and pull this building and give answers back to the owner. Here's the energy effects. And then after you've done that, you don't want to now throw away all that work and then redo it in a different energy model because that's what the, the code official is looking for. So that's when you want to meet with them and say, hey, look, <laughs> you know, this one's a $50 program. This one's a $35,000 program. I <laughs> think the answer is a little better here. Yes. Right. As you can imagine, there's such a diversification of the programs, and some of them are better for certain things than others that they've said, all right, we're going to leave it to the AHJ, and if your AHJ is stuck in the mud and I only want this one, then, you know, you got to do what you got to do. But hopefully, if you don't surprise them on the last day when you walk in with your developer and your attorney and say, sign this, you know, <laughs> hopefully you've started the day one and said, hey, we're, this is the way we're looking at doing this, they'll be more receptive. And, and you can kind of say, hey, look, here's where this, all the data is, here's where it comes out, here's how we calculated it, it you know, work together sort of approach. I guess, are we out of time or do we have time for more questions or? Okay. 
certainly, uh, if you want, uh, give me a business card or something if you have any more questions. And uh, we'll be back. All of you, thank you very much for not throwing tomatoes up here. Thank <laughs> you.